so I put a link up in here uh, that actually takes you, if you haven't looked at it yet, to a checklist document of sorts uh, that's called the syllabus from a student perspective. And let me go ahead and put it up on the screen here as well. Boy, that's not very effective at all, is it? So there we go. Okay, so hopefully you'll be able to see this now. So on one level, this is a fairly basic syllabus checklist, the type of things that a dean's office might send you to make sure that you are compliant, to use that awful term that sometimes gets thrown around in, in our higher ed administration. Uh, and I say this as a part-time administrator, so guilty. Um, but on the other hand, this is actually a document that, that invites you to ask some questions uh, about your syllabus as well. Um, and so this is an open source document, uh, and since it is linked in the slide, you should feel free if you if you want to uh, to download it, use it however you want. Um, I have found that it's a really interesting exercise to pair up with somebody uh, who is not in your field, who comes at it from a novice perspective, or as the Zen practitioners say, the beginner's mind, uh, where we don't assume that we already know everything and we're more open uh, to looking at things anew. Uh, and and looking at a course syllabus and with this checklist and going through and see what's in it and what isn't. Uh, what I'd like to do here in, in the next few minutes though, is I'd like for you to sort of look at this, the items that are listed here uh, on the checklist, some of which you probably expect in a syllabus, other things of which you might say that seems excessive and things of which you might've thought, I didn't think that goes into a syllabus or I've never thought of that way before. And I'd like you to take a little inventory of that. And I'm gonna put you into some breakout groups in a minute. And what I'm gonna ask you to talk about in those breakout groups uh, is how much of the things that are on this checklist are things that are already in your course syllabi, and be honest. And is there anything that you see on here that you might add after having looked at it or read it? So two questions like that, how, you know, to what degree is this stuff already there in a course syllabus? And if you teach a hundred level course, maybe that's the one to think about as you do this thought exercise. And then is there anything in here that you hadn't thought about before, but, you know, would be, you know, would go back and, and perhaps include now that you see it on the, on the paper. So two things to think about. Um, if you haven't done Zoom breakout rooms before, what's going to happen is in a minute, I'm going to have the, the Zoom software will automatically sort you uh, into rooms. I'm going to try to group it uh, so there's about three or four people in them. Um, you'll receive a, a, a notification on your screen that you've been invited to join breakout rooms and that they are open. And all you have to do is click join. Uh, when the breakout rooms are going to close, when I bring everybody back to the main gathering, uh, you'll receive a pop-up notification um, that uh, the breakout rooms will close in 60 seconds, um, and then you will be free to move back into this main meeting space. The one thing I cannot do in the breakout rooms is continue to screen share what I have here. Um, so I will put the link to this document into the chat, as somebody just requested. Um, thanks, Gregory, for, for doing that. Uh, and I will also be popping into the breakout rooms. My magical host powers of the Zoom meetings allow me to sort of materialize, kind of like Star Trek transporters, right? So don't be surprised if I pop in and wave a little bit uh, and then pop back out, because I am going to try to sort of circulate around the various breakout rooms, okay? So again, to, you know, what's already in your syllabus that you see on this checklist here? And are there things that kind of made you raise your eyebrows or say, huh, I hadn't thought about it that way before? Uh, and I'm interested in hearing both of those things from your group perspective, okay? So having done that, let me pull up the breakout rooms, which I do not have the capability to do all of a sudden. Uh, Megan, you might need to make me a host again in this meeting since I got kicked out earlier. Done. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. Thanks. It's you know, Let's see. Breakout rooms. Hooray. Okay. So now we're going to uh, get into breakout rooms. You can come back into the main session when you want, but I'll also be... Um, you know, sending an automated message that'll give you a 60 second warning 
as to when the breakout rooms close, okay? All right, I can always tell when the breakout rooms hit that automatic closure window because all of a sudden it goes from like six squares on the screen to like 80, you know? <laughs> so, so here's everybody. So if you haven't done Zoom breakout rooms, that's what the process looks like, hopefully a little smoother than I did in the beginning. Uh, but as a host of a meeting, and so if you're doing this with your own particular class, you have the ability to go in and out of different rooms. And so some of you, I didn't get to everybody, but some of you saw me kind of pop in uh, sometimes I was able to talk a little bit. Other times I was just a disembodied head floating over you before I winked back into the ether once again. Um, but it's a, it's kind of a cool thing to be able to do if you're meeting virtually, especially if you have a class where students are doing collaborative work with one another. This is at least a good space to start uh, that work and to have students be able to be at least in the same virtual space um, with one another. Uh, so the breakout rooms are, are, are kind of fun to do, uh, and it is a little bit of change of pace from just kind of the big, you know, huge Zoom array. Uh, and I have also found in teaching high flex classes, hybrid flexible classes, where I have some students in person and some students attending synchronously via Zoom, that most of them have their cameras off during the main class, but they will actually turn them on with one another in the breakout rooms. And so you do have a little bit more of that connection, that little, you know, kind of personal angle to it there. Um, so I am gonna uh, share my screen once again and put the document up here. There we go. So hopefully you can see that very same Google Doc, uh, the syllabus from a student perspective. If you could see that, if you could throw like a thumbs up or something in your, all right, awesome, thank you. So I'll invite and feel free to unmute yourself and, and just jump in. So it, what did you talk about in any of the groups? Did you have, you know, was there anything that y'all talked about that kind of raised your eyebrows a little bit or something that you think was really interesting and resonated with you that you'd like to kind of share out with the rest of the folks here? One thing that came up that we talked about, um, cause I've done a couple of these different checklists where you're adding in all this information to make sure that you're addressing all these student issues and concerns. How do you balance giving this much information without having your syllabus be 15 to 20 pages? Because mine, I would say I check a lot of these, but it's about a 15 page syllabus right now. I give a table of content so you can jump to where you need to go, but it's mm -hmm. a lot of information and probably pretty overwhelming, particularly for first generation college students. Yeah, that's a great point, Melissa. And I, one of the, a couple of the groups that I was listening in on, uh, were talking, you know, discussing along the same lines. Um, syllabus bloat is a thing, right? I mean, do you all have required materials that you're supposed to put in the syllabus? And does that list of required materials seem to expand uh, as we as we go semester to semester? Uh, and that's the case here too. Um, so one suggestion I would make 
is it's worth thinking about um, either individually or as a unit or even institutional level. If you have that kind of, for lack of a better term, boilerplate syllabus stuff, is there a way that can be offloaded out of the syllabus and linked through your learning management system? You know, so we use Blackboard and we, bet we built a link into the course shell menus where it says Grandview additional syllabus statements. And it's right in there and it links to a PDF. And so I don't have to put it in my syllabus. So there are some things where, you know, and usually what it is, is, you know, there, how many of you have heard that, you know, the, 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 uh, the sort of urban legend that a syllabus is legally interpreted as a contract and that so, you know, we need to be able to have this stand up in a court of law, right? Well, that's a total urban legend. There's actually no case law that establishes a precedent of a syllabus as a legally binding document. But if we treat it as such, Think of the, you know, if you've ever read a legal document, a contract, insurance paperwork, a mortgage application, you know, that is not very scintillating reading, right? So when we say students don't read the syllabus, are we giving them something that's worth reading? Uh, and so the idea of, you know, can we offload the boilerplate type stuff or can we reframe it in language that's a little more personal? So one, one thing that we did here uh, at Grandview is we used to have six pages of stuff that had to go into a course syllabus. Three pages of that was our academic dishonesty policy, but not just the policy, but here's what happens if you get dinged the first time, here's what happens if you get dinged the second time, here's what happens if you get dinged the third time. If you decide to appeal, and you better not think about it, but if you do, here's how it's gonna go. And all of this three, you know, like, and, and what it was, was we had one really weird case that freaked everybody out and said, oh, we got to put something in the syllabus. We got to have a statement so this never happens again. And oftentimes, a lot of the policy statements we have are the result of that one weird thing that happened that one time that two of our faculty colleagues are still upset about. Uh, and I only exaggerate slightly for comic effect. Uh, so how can we get some of that stuff out and or at least, you know, hum humanize the language a little bit? Uh, I think that's one of the things that I hope this document sort of spurs discussion in is how do we do that? You know, if we if we want students to read the syllabus, let's give them something worth reading. Let's use inviting language. Let's use I and we instead of the student will or the learner will, right? Like if we're trying to create personal connections in this mostly digital period of teaching that we're in now, the syllabus is likely going to be the first sustained point of contact between a student and our course. So it's like when they come into our house, what's it look like, right? You know, what, what kind of impression are we giving? You know, the cliche is true. You don't get a second chance to make a first impression. Uh, so if there are ways that you can think about where you're offloading some stuff in to really bring, you know, down to it the heart of what you want to convey in a syllabus and then refer students to other places and then circle back around to those later, that's one strategy. Uh, to avoid syllabus bloat. Uh, and that was a really long-winded kind of bloated answer to a question uh, to underscore the point. What else? What are some of the rest of you uh, reactions or things that you talked about in, in your breakout groups? Um, something that came up in our group um, was talking about how during uh, the syllabus week, students will often kind of just be sort of like glazed over at the end of the class and it's just like so much information overload and so this is a good opportunity to make your syllabus stand out in a positive way um, and we had I had a good chuckle at the all caps to make a point um, thing it made me think of a, an undergraduate chemistry class I took that had a lot of that um, and the whole syllabus had a really adversarial tone and I think it was something wild like 75% of the class didn't pass kind of a a vibe. Um, yeah, it was not not the most pleasant chemistry experience. So um, we were having a, a, a good discussion about how this is a good opportunity to make your syllabus um, stand out from the crowd of just syllabi all week. Right. Yeah, I'm glad. That's To me, that's important, right? Back to this idea of if we want them to read the syllabus, let's make it worth reading. Let's put things in there where they're able to connect with the course and connect with us and see us as actual kind of full, complicated human beings. You know, we're not teaching brains on sticks, but we're not brains on sticks either. And this is one avenue that we can use as an opportunity to convey that. Thanks. Thanks, Jane. Anybody else? Agreeing with, yeah, agreeing with what Jane said, um, one of the things that I try to do is even during that syllabus week, if I have the opportunity, 
instead of talking about the syllabus day one of class, I have a different activity that I do. It's kind of the why of the course. It gets into the concepts of the course before I even look at the syllabus. And so I get students thinking about the course and the content and what they're going to do with it and why they need to take the course and what they may get out of it. Even before I, I say, here are the things that are going to happen in the course. Here are all the rules, the guidelines and everything else. So um, flipping it around a little bit, if I have the time to be able to do that, I think works really well. And then I can refer back to that and often do throughout the semester. A couple of different videos that I use to show them and get them thinking about things is, is a really good uh, way that I've started. Yeah, I love that, Brian. Thank you. It's, you know, if we want our students to be doing things throughout the semester, we need to give them the opportunity to do that in the first day of class, right? And so maybe a rule of thumb is, is you know, the things that my students are going to be asked to do throughout the semester, I'm going to ask them to do these things during this first class. You know, it's an important tone setter. But again, also thinking about those bigger questions. You know, why are we here? What is it that, you know, what is it about this material that's going to be transformative, right? And again, that may sound like kind of overly dramatic language. Uh, but if you've ever read the book, What the Best College Teachers Do by Ken Bain, he has a section on what he calls the promising syllabus, which is the idea that, you know, our syllabi should be making promises, right? Because students are going to be different, like literally changed as a result of taking our course. What are those changes going to be? You know, how are they going to, what are they going to learn? How are they going to grow? And how are they going to know that they're doing those things? Um, you know, so the syllabus is a great place to set the conversation out like that and to help humanize us as well as invite them uh, to join the community of the class, you know, with their full selves, uh, rather than just sort of the perfunctory, you know, my name is, my major is, and, and that's about it, right? And so one of the things that, you know, we could do with this document that I invite you to use is just as a sort of way of doing exactly this, of sparking thought, of sparking conversation, and then, you know, thinking about a, a specific tool, in this case, the course syllabus, that we might not always think about, uh, that, you know, we recycle one from semester to semester, and we just sort of change the dates and a couple of the readings or something like that. And that's, you know, if we've got something that's working, that's fine. But it's, it's good to, I think, more intentionally revisit our practice and think about, you know, again, this larger question of what are we saying to our students? Um, so let me put the What the syllabus gets us at then is this understanding that our practices, you know, as, for example, outlined on the syllabus, are actually shaped by the theory that we bring to the particular space. So in this case, it's the, the particular theoretical approach we have to see, you know, what we think teaching and learning is all about. Our theory shapes our practice. So why not invite students into that conversation uh, to give them a sense of this is my approach, right? So uh, one of the things that the checklist has in there is that, you know, is there a philosophy or kind of an explanation of this is what it is about either my approach or this particular course, this is why this is important, you know, this is my chance, you know, to kind of proselytize, right, to students. So let's take advantage of that. Uh, our practice, our pedagogical practice shapes the everyday choices that we make and the methods that we use in class. If can we be intentional and transparent with students about the choices we make, about the methods we use, and why we do a particular thing? I uh, had an interesting conversation in one of the breakout groups, uh, one of the instructors to, to help keep students engaged, you know, throughout an entire Zoom session uh, by doing regular content-based quizzes at the end of a session to test students' uh, retention and learning of the particular material. Well, that's actually a really good strategy to help retain material in the long term. It's called retrieve practice. And so here's an evidence-based strategy that this instructor can now tell his students, you know, we're doing this for a reason, right? Here, here's my, here's the larger point. This is how it's going to help you. And so this is a chance for us again to invite students into that conversation. You know, the spaces that we're in, you know, this, there's a reason. It's not arbitrary. It's not hazing. It's, you know, here is something that will help you uh, and, and, you know, the, the logic behind that. But in order to be able to do all that, right, is we have to be able to articulate uh, our theoretical and our pedagogical stances. We have to be able to, to articulate to ourselves and thus to others clearly what those are. And so here are some things that I would suggest that we kind of keep in the center of these, you know, conversations about intent and discernment. Uh, you know, now more than ever, I think we need to keep in mind that we're creating teaching and learning spaces for actual human beings. You know, I've used the, the expression brains on sticks a couple times. 
uh, in this in this talk. Um, you know, it's something to avoid, right? Our students are, as we are, full, complex human beings. And if we just gear our strategies towards, you know, jamming things into their cerebral cortex, we're going to miss. Uh, and it's probably going to backfire because we're not taking into account all of the other things that go around and with that brain that comes into our classroom. One of the other things uh, that's important for us to, to bear in mind, uh, and I include myself definitely in this conversation, because as a historian, we talk all the time in our classes about what we're covering. But we need to really step back and, 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 and realize and sit with the fact that covering content is what we do, not what our students do. And so if I say, yeah, in class today, we covered the French Revolution, what I'm really saying is I talked about the French Revolution and I'm counting on the fact that my students being in the same space and hearing those words means that they know the French Revolution. And that's not how learning works, right? We know this, right? And so if I'm structuring my choices around covering content, uh, that's what I'm doing. What are my students doing while I'm covering that content? How do I think about that? And that's, I think, something that we need to, to center. Now that we're in a fully or at least partially digitally mediated environment as well, we need to think about the design choices we're making. And I know you have an instructional design staff as a resource for you there. Instructional designers are some of my favorite people in the world because they bring the expertise in both technology and pedagogy to help us on the faculty create learning spaces that help us do the things that we want to do with students. Uh, because, as I suggest here, we should be designing courses for students rather than in spite of them. Uh, you know, pedagogy is not a weapon, right? And so what are these spaces doing with and for our students should be the first question that we ask. Because learning spaces, you know, in any of these spaces, whether it's a traditional face-to-face -face class or, you know, this new hybrid or fully online environment that we find ourselves in, we have to acknowledge, you know, the reality, right? All of us, but especially students, you know, are learners in progress. We are in a process of becoming in a particular class. And students have been becoming to the particular class that they, they are sharing space with us now uh, through a, a variety of different experiences and journeys. And in our current moment, many of those journeys have been really difficult. We need to recognize that fact and design and implement accordingly, that students have taken a variety of different paths to this place where we are now in progress, walking the same road, to use Freire's term. Uh, how do we center this in our design choices? Because again, the question becomes, what are we saying to our students? Think back to this idea of the hidden curriculum, right? What are our students learning from us? And are they learning things that we would be horrified to know that we were teaching them if we were aware of it? Are we telling our students that they belong? Our universities have by admitting them. How are we reinforcing that message that yes, you do belong here. We believe you are capable of succeeding in this space. It will not be easy. It will be challenging, but that is why we are here, right? And so connecting with our students, building a social connection with our students so that all of us are what the, the researchers on online learning call socially present in a particular learning space is, is, is really important for what we're trying to do here in this sort of teaching in the era of COVID. In order for meaningful learning and student success to occur, we have to have a high degree of not just this presence, but connectedness as well. So think about social presence as the degree to which someone in an online or digital space is recognized as a full human being, as visible as that self, as a self, as opposed to an avatar picture, right? And then beyond that presence, how are we getting socially present folks, ourselves included, connected with one another? And connection doesn't always have to be synchronous connection either. There are plenty of asynchronous ways of building community and social connectedness uh, that that we can implement as well. And there's some research on this that I think is really suggestive in terms of what are some of the possibilities or the affordances that we have in either hybrid or fully online spaces. Uh, so if you've done online teaching um, before, you've read any of the research on it uh, in, in terms of high impact practices or things like that, you might be familiar with this particular model. This is Amy Whiteside uh, from 
Oh, Jesus. She's somewhere in Florida, and I apologize for forgetting her institution. Um, Amy Whiteside and her colleagues have done a lot of work on this idea of social presence in online learning. Uh, and as you see by the, the illustration here, they see, you know, meaningful and sustained social presence as an interlinking of five key components. And some of those are pretty, you know, self-evident, right? You know, instructor investment. Uh, you know, if the instructor is invested in the class, the students are more likely to be invested in the class, right? So some of this is instructor presence, you know, things that we would say, yes, yeah, so, you know, I can see how this, this feeds into social presence. But a couple of the other things I think are, are really interesting to contemplate because they might not be as front of mind at first. Uh, interaction intensity and effective association, I think, are two things that we can think more about as an area of possibility in terms of community building between us and our students. Uh, learning is not just cognitive. Learning is affective as well. Emotions matter. Um, Sarah Rose Cavanaugh has a great book called The Spark of Learning, where she talks about emotion, the science of emotion. She's a cognitive psychologist, uh, and how emotions either promote or hinder effective learning and meaningful academic experiences. Um, I have a slide at the end of this deck here that has a whole bunch of links to some of these sources, and I link her book as well if you're interested. Uh, so learning is an affective, not just a cognitive thing. Uh, and the intensity of interactions as well. You know, one of the things that was hardest for me in terms of developing, you know, my skills as an online teacher was not just building in opportunities for interaction, but paying attention to how meaningful and intensive those interactions are. You know, routine perfunctory discussion board posts five minutes before a deadline. Oh, yes, I agree. Great point. You know, that's interacting, but is that really building presence, right? So how am I creating spaces and asking questions and inviting students into interactions that have much more depth, much more intensity to them? So how am I creating spaces that foster meaningful and genuine presence in our connecting environments to build community, to build learning community with our students? So again, understanding the affective dimensions of this process. And this is particularly relevant, again, given the larger context within which we're operating. Uh, so I mentioned Kavanaugh's book, The Spark of Learning. You know, all of the things that we know from teaching and learning research about effective learning for students, they need to pay attention. We need to harness our working memory so we're able to retain particular content and materials. We need to bolster that long-term retention and, and we do so by building motivation, that students do all of these things better when they are motivated and feel connected with the particular experience they're in. So all of the things that we know work, that we know are the big ticket items for meaningful learning, Kavanaugh lets us know, considering the emotional impact of various aspects of our course design is one of the best approaches we can take. Again, learning is affective and not just cognitive. And one of the most significant ways that we need to be able to consider this affective element to our work with, with and among our students is to remember that students are our allies, not our adversaries. And in periods of high stress and anxiety, like say the whole past year, a lot of our stress, kind of our free flowing stress and anxiety kind of floats around and latches on not necessarily the right target, but the target of convenience, right? So who are we around the most and interacting the most with? Our students and our colleagues. And so that ambient stress, that, that fear, that sense of a loss of control, you know, are we now in a place where we're manifesting that on people who, who are our allies, who are interested in the same things that we are interested in? Academic success, meaningful learning, a rich ex and meaningful experience. You know, it is very easy to complain about students when we're around them a lot. And when we're doing that, even if they don't hear it, we're still saying things to them that we might not mean to say. So when we ask that question, then what are we saying to our students? You know, the syllabus exercise that we just did is a big, you know, the big underlaid question there is what are we saying to our students? What are we telling them? What do they think that we think about them? What stories have we told ourselves about our students? Students are blank. No one reads the syllabus. They're gonna cheat. 
they hate this, they like this. Even some of those like students are digital natives, so they can, you know, learn how to code in five minutes, right? That narrative is not true. It's not accurate. And it leads us to make some decisions and, and take some reactions that are counterproductive. So I think we need to be consciously asking ourselves, you know, what are we saying to our students? When we pivoted online in March, one of the things that alarmed me the most was this question. Because rather than saying we trusted them as adults, which is, I think, what we should be saying, in many cases, we told our students that, their default, that we think their default instinct was to cheat. In my teaching center, I dealt with more inquiries about proctoring software, lockdown browsers, online integrity, webcams, getting students to take pictures of their dorm rooms as they were taking a test, how they fax in, someone wanted to fax in an affidavit uh, that students signed for each exam. And I get like, you know, we there is a sense we are losing control. But are we telling our students that we think if you're given any room or latitude whatsoever that y'all are going to cheat? Right. I told you about our three page academic dishonesty statement that we used to have in our syllabus. Same thing. Right. We are telling our students we think y'all are going to do this. You are guilty till proven innocent. That is not what we should be saying for students. But when we tell students that they must use tools that have at best very problematic privacy and data security policies, for example, and tools that function inequitably. Students of color, for example, being asked to shine a light on their face through their webcam so the algorithmic software and the test taking browser recognizes their actual face. You try taking a stats exam with a light shining in your face and see how you do. What are we asking our students to do? And what are we telling them we think of them as a result? We have research, for example, on some of these um, you know, uh, lockdown browsers, academic integrity softwares, things like that. Uh, and what we know from the early returns that we have from this study that was done in 2019, for example, that some of our students are disadvantaged by the common features of online test monitoring services. We do know that they increase test anxiety. We don't know that they actually prevent cheating, but we do know that some students are being inequitably affected by the use of these tools. And so again, we need to be very discerning about our choices. I'm not saying that academic dishonesty doesn't happen or isn't a problem, but I do think that some of these tools are the equivalent of machine gunning a mosquito. In other words, it's a lot of response that doesn't necessarily guarantee a satisfactory solution. If we're worried about cheating and integrity, we need to look at the circumstances that would lead a student to make that choice, to engage in dishonesty. And so is it a super high stakes assignment that their entire grade depends on where all their motivation is extrinsic and there's a ton of pressure? That's a set of circumstances that might lead to some poor decision making. Are there ways that we could revisit that process or revisit exams or the way that we deliver assessments and the way that we differentiate assessments? Are assignment designs themselves that get at the root of this problem much more effectively than this you know, heavy handed, I would argue, approach. So as Jesse Staubel, the writer and educator, put it, you know, he did a, a Twitter hashtag several years ago, what's your four-word pedagogy? You know, kind of inspired by those six-word short stories that NPR did for a while. You could do a lot worse than this one, right? Start by trusting students. As Sean Michael Morris put it, and this was the quote that I used over and over in the spring, our students don't come to college to cheat. They come to college to learn. And so if they are making the decision to cheat, we need to interrogate that process. How did we get to that point? And then let's take some action and then let's strategize, right? Now, I mentioned that I had a very poor first semester as an undergraduate. Uh, my F, that I, my first F was an intermediate Latin. Uh, I am a Latin refugee. But even though I failed intermediate Latin that year, I do remember enough to know the infinitive form of the Latin verb educare, which is to draw out or to draw forth. And that is, of course, the root word uh, for our word education. And so in this sense, education, what we are after is a drawing out, a drawing forth with students and from our students, getting them to realize potential, to move from a fixed to a growth mindset, 
to challenge themselves, to stretch their boundaries and perspectives and to do things that they did not be, uh, see themselves as being able to do. We are in the drawing out business. We can't draw out something if it's behind a fence. It just doesn't work. So what are we saying to our students? What is the philosophy that is giving shape and meaning and coherence to the practices that we embody on an everyday basis? What would a pedagogy based on this idea of hope look like? Meaningful and substantial as opposed to airy and ethereal. So first I would suggest that acting from a place of hope, a pedagogy grounded in hope, means that we own our stance, that we acknowledge our stance, our orientation, our theory, and our practice. This is what I, you know, this is how, what I believe about our teaching and learning space. This is, these are the assumptions that I'm operating. This is the story I have. What are your stories? So we own our stance and we acknowledge that. We acknowledge our theory and our practice because that helps us create learning spaces for actual human beings. And not just that they can occupy, but feel like they belong. Are we welcoming and re-welcoming students? Not just the first day of class, but consistently, especially, even in especially digital environments where that sense of connectedness is harder to sustain. Can we create these spaces where students can be fully present as themselves? Are we inviting them and creating the spaces for them to do that? I think we do so by remembering that learning is affective, not just cognitive, and that students are our allies in this venture. They want the same things we want. They shouldn't be our adversaries. And so let's act from hope, not from fear. Pedagogy is our practice. Pedagogy is, in this sense, the sort of set of lenses that we look through, that we view the work that we're doing, our particular avocation, as well as the communities and the spaces in which we're doing that work. Pedagogy is our practice. It's how we approach our work with and among our students and with and among the university and higher education communities of which we are a part. That practice always derives from theory. How would a fish describe water? You know, the famous story from the late author David Foster Wallace, if you have, if you're not familiar with it, he tells the story of uh, two young fish swimming through the water and an older fish swims up from the other way alongside him as they pass the older fish looks at the younger fish and says what a great day the water's awesome what a great day to be swimming in the ocean. And about five minutes they keep on going and about five minutes later one of the younger fish turns to the other one and says what the hell is water. So how would we, how would a fish explain water. How would we explain the, the figurative water in which we're swimming? Do we even know we're in the pool? Are we in the right pool? Pedagogy is practice and practice always derives from theory. Or as the great philosophical trio from Canada, Rush put it in their song, Free Will, even if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. So if we choose a practice, a pedagogy, a praxis, to put it as Frere might, rooted in an ethic of hope. We repudiate hope's opposite, hopelessness, right? As Frere puts it, when it becomes a program, hopelessness paralyzes us, immobilizes us. We succumb to fatalism. Uh, so how many of us in recent days have been at least adjacent, if not in this place, right? How many of us since March? How many of us for the last several years? How many of us have felt paralyzed and immobilized? How many of our students have succumbed to fatalism? I'll never be good at math. I can't write. This subject sucks. I'm not college material. That's fatalism. And of course, the root word fatal, right? Death. It becomes impossible to muster the strength that we absolutely need for a fierce struggle that will recreate the world. And again, Frere's language may sound overwrought, but I think it's perfectly appropriate to the moment that we are in right now. We are in the world recreating business. And it is not always grandiose, dramatic, you know, flashes of thunder and lightning pronouncements. The world changes in our particular corner of it, class by class, student by student, discussion by discussion 
paper by paper, reading by reading, choice by choice, rinse, repeat. And that's where we derive our hope from, or out as, as Freire says, not out of mere stubbornness, but out of an existential concrete imperative. Let's own what we do. Teaching in this sense is a radical act of hope, radical in the root sense of the term. The word radic comes from Latin, radix, same word that gives us radish, and it means root. So a radical act at its root level, at its fundamental level, what we are doing is a radical act of hope. Because look at what we're doing, the attention and the investment and the emotional labor that we are putting into it. You are all here on January 7th and one of the weirdest, you know, after the weirdest day in U.S. history, or at least on the top 10 list, and you're here doing faculty development talking about learning and talking about community and talking about student success and thinking about your place within all of this. You're doing that for a reason, because you think it matters. Our practice embodies that. Teaching is a radical act of hope. It's for us, and it is certainly for our students as well. So we have a few minutes um, and I'm gonna open things up. I'm gonna stop screen sharing in a little bit. And if we have some questions and conversation and dialogue, that'd be great. Um, I know we go until four, the last few minutes, um, I'm gonna throw it back to Yvonne who has some sort of housekeeping and, and closing business with, with you folks to, to finish up the session for today. I will send a link uh, to these slides, which everything I cited uh, is linked in the slides as well. Um, and, or you can access them at this bit.ly address, this link that I put here as well. Um, but I'll send the link to Yvonne and you should feel free. These are Creative Commons open license. So use them, reuse them, modify them, remix them, however you wish, if you wish, uh, totally fine. And so there's where you, and down in the bottom left is where you can find me yelling on the internet from time to time. And as a historian, I am professionally and contractually obligated to provide a bibliography. Uh, so I did that as well. Uh, and that will be appended to uh, the slides uh, that I send to Yvonne. And so there will be links to the uh, source for further readings as well. So having said that, I'll make the awkward transition to stop the Zoom share so I can see the true Hollywood Squares layout of everybody. And there you all are in your little Zoom Squares. Um, so. Any questions or anything that I wasn't clear about or that you'd like to yell at me about or anything like that, now is your chance. So just for fun, <clears throat> did you say Rush said not to decide is to decide? Yep. That's actually Blaise Pascal, I believe, Ponce to think. <laughs> ah, yes. Pascal's wager, right? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Okay, so there's a reason yeah. that resonated when I first heard the song. Even so, though Rush is great. Yeah. <laughs> well, drummer. I'll have to get a slide of Pascal in there now, too. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Kevin, I'm going to interject with something from our, uh, our the breakout group that we had when we were talking about what was in our syllabi or, or should be in our syllabi. And we had a, a fabulous conversation about teaching philosophy. So I, I thought I would put you on the spot and ask if you had any, any more tips or suggestions about how to distill your teaching philosophy down to something that you might put on your syllabus or uh, share with your students? Are there any particular questions or approaches you think faculty can take to do that? Yeah, actually, Stephanie, that's a great question. Um, and I think it's really important to have something like that in a syllabus, again, to let our students know, you know, this is, this is our thing, right? This is, this is why I'm here with you. This is my vocation. This is my purpose for, for this semester. Uh, but they're also really hard to write. You know, many of you probably had to write some sort of teaching statement for academic employment at some times, and you're looking at the blank screen like, oh my God, how do I write something like this? They're really hard to do. Um, so I posed a couple questions to myself um, and did some free writing um, where, you know, the question was, why am, why am I teaching this class? And, you know, some of it was because it's my turn in the rotation, but, you know, what, why do I think this class is important? Why do I think students should take this class? 
but then what are the non-negotiables for me? What has to happen this semester for it to be successful? Uh, and that got me out of, because I used to approach it from a very sort of content-centric way because of my historian training, right? Like, we must cover all these things. But really what I was after, like, you know, the non-negotiable, like, are we going to have fun? In the sense that, like, is this, you know, is this going to be meaningful? Is this not going to suck? Like, are students going to dread coming to class or are they going to be okay with it? Because I know they're not going to all be the history majors. And so as I sort of free wrote and jotted down ideas and phrases trying to answer those questions, that's where the, the philosophy kind of emerged from. Um, one of the other things that I think was really worth doing um, was asking myself, you know, what do I really believe about learning? Right? And so one of the things I would suggest that, that was really helpful for me coming out of it, uh, and I talk about this in my book a little bit too, because I learned from others uh, some really good ideas about it, but we all put in our syllabi that accommodation statement, right? Like if you have a documented disability, here's how you get accommodations and call this person and bring this form and all of that. And what we do is, you know, we sort of make it a one person, one time, one accommodation thing, but learning isn't like that, right? And so I went from accommodations to a statement about learning where I are, you know, I believe learning is universal. I believe we learn in different ways. Uh, we learn in different patterns. We approach content in different ways, but we are all learners and thus can be successful learners. And so my job is to figure out how to help you discern what kind of learner you are. How do you be a successful learner and then help connect you to the resources that you need to grow in that success? So if that means we talk to the disability services office, great, that's one thing we can do. But there are other things and everybody's a learner. And if learning is universal, then there are other things that we can do as well. And so that became the basis of what I put in my syllabus. And so it turned into kind of getting rid of some of that bureaucratic type of language into this is what I think learning you know, is and how, how we can think about it successfully, but I want to know what I can do to help you learn successfully. And what was interesting about that was that, you know, students aren't often asked how they learn. They're asked what they learned or if they learned, but they're not asked how. And one of the things that I think students run into, the same thing I ran into in college, is I had never asked myself how I learned. And so when I didn't have answers to that and I wasn't learning successfully, I didn't know where to go, right? So we, if we want students to think of themselves as learners and we, you know, thinking metacognitively, which we know is a good thing for learning, we have to ask them those questions. They're not going to do things that they have not yet been asked to do. And so asking students to think of themselves as a learner and even write out the first day of class, what can I do to help you learn? What can I do to help you learn better? What would you like this class to be? Asking students for their goals for the class. And it could be something as simple as, I don't want this class to suck. You know, that's great common ground because I don't want this class to suck either. So we are here, right? But then you can get into that sort of conversation that has students kind of thinking about, you know, what am I doing here? What do I really want out of this class? Why am I taking this core class? What do I want to bring with me from this class when I go into my accounting major or whatever it is? What do I want to get out of it? And inviting students into that space, especially first year students, that can be a really meaningful conversation because it helps now reframe, you know, you are not just a passive recipient of content. You know, you are an active learner now and, you know, and this is what college is and this is what higher education is. And so let's, let's get started on that work. Thank you. That was a fabulous answer. Thanks. It was somewhat long-winded, for which I apologize. <laughs> Other questions? And feel free to put something in the chat, too, if you don't want to unmute or anything like that. I do have the chat window up as well. And not all at once, because it's really hard to hear, you know, what everybody's talking at the same time. Uh, this is King Chung, and thank you for this uh, wonderful talk. Um, I just have a question about um, if you say we require responders to um, do the testing, and you know, some students may feel, you know, that is uh, uh, like. Uh, you know, a stress factor for them. 
but the thing is that you know there was one time I also you know I was administering um, the uh, un an undergrad test and then you know and then I forgot to put the responders and then I put it on and then some students said that well that's not fair then I was thinking why is it not fair so you know unless you're thinking about you know like uh, using other ways to answer the questions then it becomes unfair but you know I I'm wondering, you know, how if we do not um, have that kind of uh, um, quest, you know, that kind of uh, that tool, then we're going to make sure, you know, because some students obviously would not cheat, but sometimes, you know, some students might, and then we are creating, uh, you know, like uh, an environment that is sort of like, you know, free free for grabs. You know, the gra the grades wouldn't be fair at that time so how do you resolve that um kind of uh, question or you know that kind of problem or issue those are great questions um and i think you know the the best way to approach this issue is to is to have as many people at the table in terms of the decisions whether it's a departmental or a larger academic unit decision or even if it's individual classes within a department, I think it's still worth talking with colleagues about, you know, what are these tools? What do they ask students to do? And is that something that we're comfortable with asking our students to do? And if the answer is yes, and if there are clear and what you think compelling pedagogical reasons to use, those tools, whether it's an equity issue or, you know, to use an example, we have uh, some of our upper level accounting classes use respondents because they give high stakes exams that are basically uh, warm ups for the licensure exam that accountants have to take. And so to replicate that experience, this is what the students are going to need to be able to do in the digital environment they need to be in. And so in that case, that was a compelling pedagogical reason to use the tool. And what made it successful was that they had talked about it as a, as a cohort of faculty, but then also were very transparent with students. You know, we're not doing this as a gotcha thing. We are doing this for these reasons, for these specific reasons. And this is what you can expect when you use this tool. And that's the other thing. If we're using some of these tools, the first exposure students have to them can't be in an actual test itself. I think that's a little too much of a cognitive load to put in. But the two things that I would also say are that, you know, cheating has, has predated technology and online learning. Um, and one of the best, and I'll put the title in the chat, uh, if you've ever read anything by James Lang, um, he wrote a really good book a few years ago called Cheating Lessons where he examined this issue of academic integrity and you know why students make the decision to be dishonest, to cheat on an exam, to plagiarize a paper. And he has some really interesting results and thoughts that come out of this study. And in particular, he looks at you know, the assignment design around uh, the, this decision-making process for students. Uh, we benefited a lot as a faculty here at my university from reading that book. Um, we had a discussion group on it and, and Jim came and gave a presentation to us on, on the research. Um, what we took out of that is to be more collaborative with students, but also to be much more discerning about, you know, is this something, is the benefit from using this tool cutting down on cheating, you know, by a handful of students, does that balance out with more students who might have test anxiety exacerbated by the use of this particular tool? And for us, with about a 60% first generation student population, we had to talk about that fairly extensively. So those collaborative conversations and then transparency with students, whatever path you end up taking or tool you end up adopting, I think those are those are two key elements in making it successful. Oh, cool, you have it as an ebook. I highly recommend that book. It really, it, it changed the way a lot of us and, and me in particular, it really got at kind of how I think about exams and kind of high stakes assessments to begin with. It was a really, uh, it, it, it was a very productive book in terms of my own thought process and teaching. And, and Jim is a great writer too. So it's, it's actually fun to read. Yeah, thank you. And um... Yeah, I think for the undergrads, you know, I find that I have to give them a, like a, um, 
mock exam so mm -hmm. that they try out everything, fix everything, and then you know just uh, and then on the day of the exam, then they would uh, you know they would be able to do it. But for the grad student, apparently, you know, they would just do it and then they just have no problems. And then I even gave them the mock exam and then they didn't seem to have any you know, problems with it. Yeah. So I guess, you know, there is, uh, you know, the test anxiety or whatever, you know, can be different, you know, among different groups of students too. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay, well, once again, before I throw it back to Yvonne, then um, I just wanna thank you for allowing me to, to share your space today. Uh, I wanna thank you for hanging in for almost three hours of Zoom, even with a break. That's a, that's a big ask. And the fact that y'all are here doing this work, thinking about these things, thinking about your students, your community is, is awesome. Uh, and your students are lucky to have you so invested in their success. And so I wish you the best of luck as your semester begins. Uh, please do feel free to reach out uh, if there's any other things that you'd like to converse about or if I can be of service in the future. And again, I'll share the link uh, to the slides and materials with Yvonne. Uh, and you should feel free to use the materials however you wish. But again, thank you very much uh, for inviting me here today and, and for being here with me. Thanks, Kevin. Yvonne, I don't think we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, thank you so much, Kevin, for sharing your insights today. We deeply appreciate it. If each of you could please share an emoji or a thank you note in the chat to let Kevin know how much we appreciate his insights. Please um, do that now. And Kevin, we, we sincerely appreciate you sharing your thought provoking remarks with the NIU community. The timeliness of your presentation on creating communities of hope is um, perfect and you address some complex, controversial, and sensitive issues that we, as well as our students, are all navigating in this unprecedented time in history. And the techniques that we discuss for building community in our classrooms, using culturally responsive teaching practices, creating meaningful learning experiences, and building presence and connections will help us support our students' success and help us to create that pedagogy of hope in our classrooms. We're grateful that you shared compelling examples that we can readily apply and that you challenged us to consider and reconsider the knowledge producers in our disciplines and others that we may consider bringing into our classrooms as well. As you said, it is very important for us to act from a foundation of hope, not from a foundation of fear. And those are compelling insights for us to build upon from this moment on. We are thrilled to kick off the 2021 spring semester with your, um, you as our keynote speaker. We would also like to thank the Disability Resource Center uh, representative, Christina, who uh, provided live captioning for us today. And um, I have posted a link to a program evaluation in the chat. So if you all could please click on that link and submit um, the program evaluation, we would appreciate it. And for those people who have, who were registered for the program and participated today, 
we will be sending out um, a link for you to access Dr. Gannon's ebook um, titled Radical Hope. So you should be getting that in um, the near future. And I'd also like to remind you to um, take advantage of the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning resources that we have for you. And we're here to help you. And we are excited to um, kick off the semester with you. And please remain hopeful and let the Center for Teaching and Learning, uh, Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning staff know if we can help you. So thanks you all for coming today. And we look forward to engaging with you in our regular day-to-day -day duties. Have a great spring semester. Thank you.